The Menar Group, which currently sells none of its coal to Eskim, today pledged to come to Eskim's assistance by selling coal to the State Electricity Corporation at a cheaper price from two of its newest projects. Springfield and we've got Ukufisa Phase 2. These are big projects, it, which uh, I mean, each of them is going to produce about 7 million tonne per annum and that means like 14 million tonne per annum production and we are prepared to put the capital on the, on the ground so we don't need ESCOM to put the capital and we think that we can set a good example in the market to show that we can supply coal to ESCOM at a cheap at a cheaper price than whatever they're paying at the moment in the in the current market and we think that it's crucial because I mean we live in this country and the power uh, uh, power security of power supply is critical I mean we see what happens when there's load shedding it's a it's a mess so if if ESCOM fails South Africa will fail so we can't really afford to let ESCOM fail so we have to do everything that we can do in our own capacity as a coal supplier to see how we can help ESCOM so it's not like, okay, well, whatever ESCOM do, it does, it's, it's their problem. We can't say that. I mean, as responsible citizens, I mean, my duty is, from my side, what can I do for ESCOM? And, I mean, because I'm in coal mining industry and I'm operating coal mines, I'm saying to myself, okay, I can go and offer ESCOM cheaper coal, and then that can, that can set a good, good example. Because if you look at the history of coal supply to ESCOM, I mean, South 32, B, B, before that was BHP Billiton and Anglo. These were actually supplying coal to ESCOM at a, at a highly competitive rate. And they were doing the right things, like putting the coal on a, on a conveyor belt, supplying it to the power station at a, at a good price. When ESCOM lost these kind of contracts and when they started buying like on spot basis, their price uh, base started escalating, which actually caused a lot of problems because ESCOM's two, uh, two issues are, one is the capital expenditure they spent for Kusila and Medupi is a bit high, and it's delayed, and because of the delay, they, the cost of uh, cost is like uh, cost is on their on their balance sheet, and it's unbearable. That's why they're and they ended up like with the 423 billion rand debt. And the other reason is their the biggest cost drive is coal procurement, because like more than 85 percent of their cost is coal. So if they buy the coal at a at a competitive price, then that will deal with their with their cost of power and that would mean that South Africans can get cheaper power and that would actually uh, grow the economy because if this is an emerging economy you can't have high, uh, high price uh, for, for power if you have the low price then the investors will come then aluminium producers will come in then ferromanganese producers, ferrochrome producers will come and they will invest in South Africa but with high ESCOM, uh, with high power rate that is going to be a deterrent for the, for the investors to come and invest in South Africa. Hence, I'm thinking that there should be an initiative in the industry to say that, okay, we will supply coal to ESCOM as competitive as possible. Open book basis. We can show everything to them. And they don't have money. We're not expecting them to come and put capital on the ground and say, okay, here is the billion rand, start this mine. No, we, we know that it's not realistic. So we are prepared to do that. We just like want to support ESCOM to, to, to supply the coal at the right price because if you don't have a stable uh, like economy, then it affects everything. Because let me tell you what the next thing is going to be if you don't do that. The next thing is going to be let's nationalize the, the mines, the good quality mines. I don't want to go to that, 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 that stage because, I mean, if ESCOM is successful, nobody is going to argue that. But if ESCOM is not going to be successful, it's natural. I mean, any country is going to say, okay, but guys, we're not getting the right quality coal at the right price, so what are we going to do? We don't have power in this country and you're exporting the product to, to Asia and, and, and Europe wherever you, or east of, east of Africa or North Africa. So it is a real discussion and the coal producers should come to the party and then explain and, and argue and discuss like what can we do for ESCOM to make sure that your delivered cost of coal is cheap. So you're prepared to work on an open book basis and they can have a look at what you, your yes. costs are and, and but... What about the transparency of the coal price itself? We have a situation at Richards Bay where we get that input of what the international prices are. Yeah. We don't really know what the Eskom prices are. It's sort of clouded in secrecy. Could the time have been reached where you open up now and show what prices you're buying at? Would that help? I think that's critical. It's a very important point. You see, Eskom has got three types of contracts. It's cost plus, which is... Uh, 
ideally should be like, like low prices. I don't know what they are, but they should be low. And then they've got fixed term contracts. Uh, again, they should be kind of on the low side of the pricing uh, curve. And then there are spot, price, spot contracts that they buy coal on a spot basis for the power stations that they don't have a, 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 a mine that's feeding the, the power station. So the problem starts with that spot contracts. So what it determines ESCOM to pay you a, a different price and to pay me a different price? It's a decision of a person, right? At the discretion of the, the, coal, uh, the coal procurement person, if we are supplying the same quality coal. So to, de to deal with that, and actually that can cause corruption. So that's the reality. So to deal with that element, what do you do? Like uh, you, you said, if you go and buy a ton of coal at, uh, at RBCT, free on board, there's a price for it. It's called API4. If you do that at Newcastle, Australia, there's a, there's a price for it. If you do that in, uh, in Amsterdam or Rotterdam or Antwerp, there's a price for, for that coal, delivered price. So why don't we have an index price that's created by, by ESCOM and the industry together, okay? And then whatever is ESCOM uh, supplied, if it's the same quality coal, then everybody gets the same price. So then it doesn't link really with my personal uh, negotiation power or your personal negotiation power, but it is ob about the realities and wh whatever the market is. And obviously it, it is going to be linked to international coal prices, it's going to be linked to <coughs> inflation in the country, it's going to be linked to steel prices, copper prices, but it's going to be a mixture of things that's going to determine an index. And if there's enough coal in the market, obviously ESCOM is going to pay less. If there's not enough coal in the market, ESCOM is going to pay more. But the reality is the element of corruption is going to be minimized. If we are serious about fixing ESCOM, I think we have to look at all the coal contracts. They have to look at all the coal contracts. And they have to seriously consider an index pricing regime for the spot contracts that they, they, are, they are making. And would that be difficult to do? I don't think so. There are, I think there are experts in the, in the world that they can get, uh, like, uh, they can get uh, uh, like uh, the, the work done, uh, like how they can create a, a, an index price, and uh, they need to just get them involved, and then they put some scenarios, and then they go and negotiate with the with the coal coal suppliers, and then uh, then we we got a we got a system, we got an index pricing, and some people say, look, I mean, this is anti-competitive. What is anti-competitive? I mean, if I know what, at what price Exaro is supplying to ESCOM, as a citizen of South Africa, what is anti-competitive with that? Whatever is happening is unbearable at the moment. I mean, my house is two kilometers away from here and it takes one and a half hour to go when there's load shedding. I mean, why, why is it happening? Why do not robots work? Because there's no power supply. So you can't carry on running a country without power. That's first thing. And then you can't carry on running a country with high power, uh, high price power. So we have to deal with these two. Now there's no availability. The power is not available. And the second thing is power is expensive for, a, for an emerging country. So how do you deal with this? You have to have transparency. There's no other way. You can't have, an, uh, you, you can't have a situation where nobody knows about the prices and then you find out after five years that Guptas were paid 22 rand 50 a gigajoule. And what is the value of the assets under your control? How many people do you employ? What sort of turnover in rands and cents do you do a year? If you look at the overall group uh, as, as Manor Holding Group, we have uh, 3,500 people, including Zuland, Antrasat, Colliery, and Kangra Coal. Uh, we have 3,500 people. And with the projects that are in the pipeline that we will start, we will double it in. in three years time, we will double our workforce. And that's the actually drive that we have, because we think that uh, employment is critical for the economy, and uh, that's, uh, that we can play a role, because uh, we're getting the resource, and uh, we are thinking that to pay back, uh, we need to do the right things for the communities, and we need to employ people, and that should be consistent and sustainable. Uh, so it's not like a five-year project we would like to have as uh, long life as possible for the mines that will actually guarantee the jobs for, for, for the people. So uh, if you look at the overall group, we are about, about 900 million ton reserve base and uh, we have seven plants operating in the country 
And uh, like I said, we've got a pipeline of projects which are very exciting for us. And uh, when we get a mining right granted, then we get very excited. We become like children. We celebrate it and then we, we say, okay, now we will employ another, let's say, 300 people, 400 people, depending on the project. If it's open cost, less people. If it's underground, obviously we employ more people. And um, so I think we created a valuable asset for, for the coal mining industry in South Africa. We don't have rehab, uh, like historical rehab issues. We are doing concurrent rehabilitation and we are complying with the laws of the country uh, according to environmental uh, authorization that we get and according to the, to the water use license. So regarding that we are 100% compliant and that is a, a very competitive edge not to have this a historical rehab liability because it's a very lean company and uh, that also makes us like to survive during dark times when the coal price is low and uh, we still carry on mining because our, our, cost, our cost is very low and uh, I mean if the, if the, even if the coal price goes to $50 we carry on and uh, like I mean there are a lot of companies that are shutting down when the coal price goes down to, to those kind of levels and the, the reason why we do not close the shop during uh, low price times is because we are running very lean operations. And how do you fund yourself? What is your funding model? Uh, our funding is coming from our own operations, like we make money and uh, we do not distribute dividends. Uh, instead, we use that money back into the business we, to, to create new mines. Because uh, we realized when we started, like we started with small deposits and then if you do not get a large deposit then you don't have a long, uh, long life mine. So uh, all the cash generated within business, we put it back into the business to create new projects. So we do not really raise money in the market and uh, sometimes I'm asked like if I'm going to list the business, I say uh, not really because uh, coal is not uh, really sexy. Uh, people are not really uh, interested in investing in coal. But coal is a need. I mean, you have to have coal. If you look at, uh, like, at the moment, 38% of the world's energy is produced out of coal. So it's a huge amount, 38%. And uh, it's, it's kind of like uh, disappearing in Europe, but there's a big drive in Asia uh, to put coal-fired power stations because it's cheap. And with the new technologies that they put the, to deal with the, with the pollution control, uh, I think uh, coal is still going to be staying there uh, for the next, say, 30 to 40 years. If you look at the coal uh, fire, pl uh, fire power plant ages in, in Asia, it's like uh, more than 90% is less than 10 years. And if you've got a plant which is less than 10 years old, that means you're going to run that plant another 30 years. You need coal. It's already invested, right? You can't just like shut them shut the power station down. And if you look at what's happening in Europe, like look at Germany, Germany decided to get out of coal. Why? Because their power stations are old. So they've got that luxury that the investments already paid off. So they go into renewables and they're trying that and they're also linked into the European grid. So if their windmill doesn't, doesn't produce, then they get the support from another country which is producing power with gas. But we don't have I mean, many, many countries in Asia do not have that luxury because their grid is not that interlinked. So they need to have power, like India needs power to, to grow their economy like China did. Okay? But obviously the critical thing is investing in, uh, in, in technologies that will deal with, with the air pollution, uh, including like carbon capture and storage or uh, putting the nice uh, right filters to deal with the, with, the, with the bad gases. But the reality is in, 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 if, you look at the, uh, if you look at the information which is available in, 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 in the internet, there is 1,600 power plants in 62 countries. Currently we are talking about they're either planned or under construction. So where is the coal going to come from? Like Rio Tinto is out of coal. They, they've got no, no coal, uh, coal mines or coal projects. They sold out. Anglo sold their ESCOM coal assets. They have very, they got very limited operation in South Africa in terms of thermal coal. SA32 is divesting their coal assets. So who's going to produce the coal? I mean, the, the world needs coal. At the moment, the world is short of like 70 to 80 million tons per annum uh, that needs to be sold on the over, over sea, like uh, free on board, uh, and it, it must go to Asia or Europe or, uh, or, uh, or, or South America. But it, the world needs coal. So my point is, world is not, uh, the coal is not going to disappear. Okay, and uh, and uh, 
we can build our business on the back of that. And with the companies that are getting out of coal, uh, means that it's an opportunity for us.